Seth is a renowned author, musician, and performer whose work spans the worlds of theater, music, and literature. As a gifted pianist, he has graced Broadway stages and has shared the spotlight with some of the most iconic names in the show business. Seth's keen wit, charisma, and deep appreciation for the arts have endured him to the audi audiences worldwide. Seth is not just a brilliant musician and performer. He is a prolific writer. His books, whether memoirs, works of fiction, are filled with humor, heart, and keen insight into the world of entertainment. His writing is a delightful blend of storytelling, humor, and profound observations about the human condition. Through his unique lens, Seth offers a captivating glimpse into the backstage world of theaters and the personalities that make him so enchanting. Joining Seth on stage today is our very own Debbie Miller, executive producer of the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival. Debbie is an integral member of our team and driving force behind our success. In addition to being the executive producer, her past experience includes being the talent coordinator for the Palm Springs Follies and Annenberg Theater. Today we have the privilege of delving into Seth's literary world, exploring his creative process, his passion for the arts, and perhaps uncovering some behind the scenes tales from his rich experiences in the world of entertainment. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great enthusiasm that we welcome Seth and Debbie to the Rancher Series. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> well, there it is. Hi, everyone. Hi, Amy. Hi, Julie. Thank you. That was so nice. That was a pretty big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Most of it was for you, I think. I assume the majority. So. Yes, dear. I thought I knew a lot about theater. I've been a theater geek all my life. So have I. I knew a lot. And then I read this. And of course, I've listened to Seth on Sirius XM. Seth Speaks. Thank you, drivers. Thank you, drivers. And Seth's Big Fat Broadway. And the stories he tells are absolutely amazing. Okay. So before we get to those stories, yes, dear. tell me about you. How'd you get into music? Why'd you fall in love with Broadway? Give us a little history. Uh, what I found out today, by the way, the lovely Jamie and Debbie took me and my parents out, my dad and his wife, uh, to lunch. And what I didn't even know is that the reason we had a piano is because my Aunt Flory, my dad's sister. So she was moving. She gave us the piano, the Mason Hamlin. I don't know why we had that piano. My sister was 10 years older than me. She is 10 years older than me. And Beth played the piano. And because I was, you know, like a little brother, I was like, oh, I want to play the piano too. So I began playing piano because my sister Beth. Um, I advanced very quickly, I mean, I'll, I'd go to piano school, like the, the signature story when I knew that I was talented, quote unquote, and I was, I was not a prodigy, I was, just, I was just advanced, is that there was like, in the John Thompson book, like the right side of the page was, you know, you're supposed to learn that, and the left side was the teacher part that was like, and when I was six, I was like, <laughs> and I read both, and I was like, I'm a genius. So that's when I knew, like, <laughs> I was advanced playing the piano. So I was at the piano, and then um, I think I may tell the story in the book, but, but in, I, I loved music, and my parents, back in the day before there were headphones, you know, whatever your parents listened to, you listened to, because there was a record player in the house, and my parents were always playing um, usually Broadway show albums, so I became obsessed with this show called The Most Happy Fella when I was probably... I think two and a half years old, and I, I can't tell how much I loved it. And I do like a whole set. I'm doing a show actually at the Purple Room in March, I think. I'm going to sort of talk more about that. I know, I can't wait. But the point is, I love that, but really what got me obsessed is um, in second grade, normally we would go to like this little hotel for a couple of days on, on the holiday break, and my dad and my mom said, oh, let's take the money we were going to spend in a hotel, because we're from Long Island, and spend it on seeing three Broadway shows. So we saw, I'll go to the piano. One of the shows we saw was. Anybody? Where's Norman of Greece? The other one was, uh, yes, Pippin. And weirdly, the show that got me the most obsessed, and which was in the 70s, it was like a six week run, but we caught within those six weeks um, the opening vamp. Who knows it? Hurry up. Hurry up. Yes! Pajama game, exactly. Pajama game. And that's, I became obsessed with Broadway because of the pajama game. And really that number, those are, the, those are the songs I've always loved, which are not really the love song. I always love a scene that's turned into a song. I just, it blows my mind. That's why I love Les Mis with like One Day More and At the End of the Day. So 
um, the beginning of the pajama game, it's a factory, and one group's going, hurry up, the other group's going, can't waste time, third group's going, when you're racing, and I was just like, oh my god. So it was really seeing that Broadway show in second grade that got me obsessed with Broadway. That's amazing. I loved it. So, there's a lot of really nice people in the audience, oh, right. and some of them happen to be very good friends of yours and mine. Yes. Would you like to tell us about some of them? I said to Deb, she said, oh, we should say who's here, and I said, I'll tell a story about each one as, <laughs> as a little introduction. So I hope we have a lot of time. Exactly. Well, I thought it'd be fun. So first of all, my lawyer, who I love so much, which sounds so fancy, my lawyer, but you, know, you need a lawyer to negotiate contracts, who basically, when I say my lawyer, he's basically every single person's lawyer on Broadway. The amazing Mark Sendroff is here. I love Mark Sendroff. So my comedy story, one of his clients is the amazing Mark Shaman, who wrote Hairspray. And Mark's husband is maybe 10 years younger, this really good looking guy, and you know, Mark's a little gray and Lou's not. Anyway, the story that Mark told me, not that recently, they were, uh, Mark had to go to the hospital for like a broken finger or something, and his husband, Lou, left the room to go to the bathroom. And the doctor came in, Mark said, okay, what's going on, what should I do? And the doctor said, don't you want to wait until your son gets back? Oh! <laughs> and Mark didn't tell me, Mark Shaman told me that story. All right. Um, <laughs> Someone else um, that's here in the room, um, the incredible lyricist who, my God, the lyrics, I can't even tell you, my head comes off from his first Broadway show, the amazing David Zippel is here. Bravo. <laughs> City of Angels, City of Angels has so many 16th notes, meaning it's like, not like, I love you. It's like, -da 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 -da. and like David was able to write these brilliant lyrics. And he, I write in the book about how Cy Coleman teamed up with him. And Cy Coleman was this majorly established Broadway composer and then chose a newcomer, which is amazing for City of Angels. And boy, David stepped up. And one of my Cy Coleman stories, I don't know if you even know the story, Valerie Harper told me this, that Valerie was a dancer in Wildcat. And during Wildcat, they had an actual doggy. You know, do you remember who starred in Wildcat on Broadway? Anybody? <laughs> Lucille Ball. <laughs> How did you know Lucy Arnaz? And so anyway, <laughs> Lucille Ball started, and Valerie told me that the doggy, basically during uh, you know, uh, being unleashed, came on stage and let's just say did his business and then left. And Valerie said all the dancers were backstage waiting to go on. They're like, what do we do? And they were wearing white. <gasps> and Valerie said that Lucille Ball went out on stage, literally cleaned it up, and then looked at the audience and said, I should have read my contract more carefully. And <laughs> <laughs> bravo. Still got it. So speaking of which, by the way, I was interviewing Marvin Hamlish. He told me he lived with Carol Bayer Sager, next door to Neil Simon, and Marvin and Neil would like kind of talk over their bushes, so showbiz style, and Marvin would be like, it's so hard living with a lyricist, because like, I'm a composer and we fight all the time. And then one day he got a knock on the door and there was like a pile of pages. And Marvin began reading them and he was like, these are my private personal stories about being with a lyricist's girlfriend. And then he's like, this is good. And he turned into their playing our song, starring the amazing Lucy Arnaz, who's here right now. Thank you, Lucy Arnaz. Yep. Watch that Tony War performance. That is such a brilliant Tony War performance. It is on, oh my God, it's so good. Um, who else? And okay. Seth, um, yes, speaking here. of that performance, yes. we were lucky enough to go to New York and see Lucy and Robert Klein do the revival. How many years? Oh, that one it you just did? So oh it was God. right before COVID, and we got to go to New York, and all those years later, they were just as amazing as the first Oh, time. I believe it. Bra, ba, Luciana. Um, the other person that's here, because she's doing a show at the Purple Room, the incredible, one of the best voices on Broadway, the amazing Miss Liz Calloway. Yeah. Hi, Liz. <laughs> um, one of my favorite Liz stories is she um, starred in Baby. I mean, it's one of the, literally one of the best Broadway albums that ever existed and one of the best singing performances ever. And after that, she told me she was friends with Richard Malby Jr., who directed it. He was going to direct Song and Dance, and Bernadette Peters was starring, and he said, Liz, you're so young, you'd be a great standby, which we'll talk about later. Being a standby means like being an understudy. You'd be a great standby for Bernadette Peters. She learned it. She was ready to go on Broadway. He said, ooh, the last thing you have to do is just audition for um, the final producer. Liz auditioned, and the producer was like, it's supposed to be a British character. Liz doesn't seem British. She's not getting it. And Liz was like, oh, my God, I'm devastated. I thought I was going to be the standby, you know, really make kind of good money and have this great gig. The end of the story is she didn't get it. However, the amazing thing is Liz would have gone on for Bernadette Peters if she was sick. Bernadette Peters only got sick once. What was the date she got sick, Liz? October 19th. And what happened on October? What were you doing on that October 19th that Bernadette was sick? Oh. <laughs> Can you believe it? She would have had to be like, marriage, belting, marriage, belting. And thank God she didn't get the gig. Yes, dear. On her anniversary. 
Jessica Bolte, Jessica, thank you. That's fabulous. And my final person, I think I got everyone, is my pal, the brilliant director, Mr. Richard J. Alexander is here. Hey, Richard J. <laughs> Richard used to do um, Les Mis forever, and when I was first doing Les Mis, he was responsible for my first Fontaine, who was the incredible Andrew McArdle, Broadway's first Annie. And one of my favorite stories, which maybe is in the book, is that Andrea talked, and if you don't know the role of Fontaine, you, you know, after you sing A Dream a Dream, you're dead. So basically, um, you don't do anything for the end of Act 1, then you come back in Act 2 because it's an ensemble show. You come back in the chorus, and Fantine comes back dressed as a boy, a bullet boy, and does the whole barricade stuff. So Andrea told me that she loved doing Les Mis because like, she could gain weight because all the dresses were so big. So she said she was like backstage as a boy eating a big quarter-pound bag of M&Ms, and, um, you know, literally quarter-pound. And the night that her friends came, she was like, oh, my friends are in the audience. I'm going to do a really fabulous death on the barricade because my friends were in the audience and she used to be a gymnast. So she said she climbed to the top of the barricade during her death scene, hooked her foot into the top and flung her body backwards to die, forgetting there was a quarter pound bag of <gasps> M&Ms in her pocket, which literally came down <laughs> a beautiful rainbow and the show closed. Um, just a couple years later. Uh, so those are all my esteemed guests, I think, right? I haven't forgotten. Those are all of Thank them. you, esteemed guests. And thank you, by the way, one of the theater kids that's here, Xavier, thank you for cutting school. I highly applaud you for doing that. Thank you, Xavier. <laughs> Hate school. Yes. So for some people in the audience yes, who might dear. not be quite as astute, yes, dear. explain to us the difference between a standby and an understudy. Sure. So um, there are standby, there's three, right? Wait, understudy, standby, sw swing. Okay, so there are three, three types of covers. So an understudy means that you're in the show, but you understudy a bigger role. Meaning like if you ever listen to the Wicked Cast album, everyone goes, no one mourns the wicked. And someone goes, no one cries, they won't return. That soloist was originally, her name is Christy Cates. She's the understudy for Elphaba. So she's in the show every night, but she understudies a bigger role. So normally most shows just have understudies and that's what Christy Cates was. However, when the role is either a really famous person or it's a really difficult sing, as we say, like Elphaba, you usually need a quote-unquote higher quality of understudy because either the person is famous or it's really hard to do, so they'll have a standby. So Wicked also has a standby. Originally, it was um, Eden Espinoza. A standby means you only go on for that leading role or maybe two different leading roles, and that way you get a better quality performer in a sense because they don't have to do ensemble eight shows a week. So an understudy is in the show, usually the ensemble, understudy is a bigger part. A standby literally only goes on for the lead. And back in the day, and unfortunately they don't do this as much anymore, you used to not have to be at the theater. So you had to be in the vicinity. So Megan Hilty, when she was understudying Kristen Chenoweth, she had to be within 10 blocks of the theater where Wicked was. So she said she would use that to like do important projects like what restaurant in Times Square has the best chocolate cake. So she would spend the show investigating. So you don't have to be there, you get a beep. So that's a standby. A swing is someone that understudies uh, basically a big group of people usually the entire ensemble. Usually there's at least a male swing for all the men in the chorus, a female swing for all the females in the chorus. And it's really difficult. You may go, well, well you're just in the chorus. Like, first of all, you have to know all the harmony. So you have to be a good musician. You gotta sing all the harmony parts, all the different tiny solos. And you have to know not only all the choreography, which usually is often different, but you're in different places. You have to have a mathematician mind because you have to see in the giant grid that's the stage, where do you actually slot in? And I think one of the stories I tell in the book is my friend Jim Borstelman, who was a swing in Jerome Robbins' Broadway, which was like, you know, a review of all the best Jerome Robbins shows. And when he went on in West Side Story, he wasn't in the exact perfect position during the rumble. And he wound up turning really abruptly to the right and he hit his face into a pole and his tooth got knocked out. And because he was like, where's my tooth? He forgot to um, catch Joey McNeely who was jumping and Joey <laughs> fell and broke his wrist. So Jim kept doing it. He said he left the stage and his white rumble outfit, his white t-shirt was completely like bright red. And they were like, go to the hospital. And while he was leaving, he literally heard like one of the matinee ladies say, the rumble this afternoon was so realistic. <laughs> <laughs> I was bleeding. So that's a swing, understudy, standby. There you go. <laughs> all in the book, yes, dear. See, the, the book is amazing. You guys, I know you all have it in your lap. You really should read it. There's so many incredible stories. Thank so you. your time in Phantom, that was the longest gig you had. So explain to me yeah, how I was that kind worked. Of, I basically made my living for a long time until my husband kind of put the kibosh on it. No wife of mine is gonna work. No, not at all. No, basically my husband James, <laughs> 
James, I would, okay, so let me go back. I was a sub, which is kind of like being an understudy. So I normally never played eight shows a week on Broadway except for Grease. Normally I was a sub, which I really loved, meaning you're an understudy for the musician. So I would play around, usually at a time, four different Broadway shows, like Les Mis, Phantom, maybe Grease, you know, Ragtime was later on, but, but How to Succeed. Meaning like I'd play a matinee of Les Mis and a nighttime of Phantom, and it was really fun. But James finally said to me, speaking of being a prolific writer, I had a kind of a contract to write a young adult book and I kept putting it off and James was like, instead of playing Phantom for like the 50th time, why don't you just spend tonight writing your book? So he kind of told me, he's like, you gotta stop with the subbing and actually focus on the writing. But my point is I used to sub a lot of Broadway shows and Phantom was the one that I subbed the longest off and on for 15 years. And the, it's really fun, you know, I've been both an understudy on Broadway as an actor and I've been a sub musician. And when you're an understudy, you get a lot of training and you're rehearsed, um, you know, you're rehearsed by the stage manager on the set. Maybe the set doesn't fully work because they don't want to spend the money, but you're walking around the set and you rehearse with the other actors and you're kind of prepared by the stage manager to go on. When you're a sub-musician, you do everything yourself. So it's, it's a very interesting world and that's why I wrote my first book, which was called Subbing, but my publisher was like, I've never heard a more boring, horrible title. <laughs> so I had to change it to Broadway Nights. But basically my first book was called Subbing because I think it's such an interesting world. So what you do is you go to the Broadway show, you record it in the orchestra pit, which is illegal, but F that. So you record the whole thing, and you have to record it because you have to know what it sounds like. The, like an album of a Broadway show is not the same thing as what the Broadway show is because there's scene change music, there are extra verses, the tempos are different. So you have to record the whole thing in order to learn it at home. And you, you play along with it at home so you get to know what it's like. And then as opposed to being an understudy where you're hired and the first time you go on, you go on, maybe you mess up, maybe you don't, it is what it is. When you're a sub, the first time you go on, first of all, you get no rehearsal. The first time you ever play the show is during an actual performance on Broadway. So in other words, you can't go like, sorry, can we start again? Because it literally is like the Broadway show. And if you mess up, you're just never asked back again. There's no like, well, you hired me, deal with it. Your audition is your first time going on. So I actually really enjoy, like I, I just, I like that kind of pressure. It's exciting to me. So I always liked it, but I guess, I think maybe the story I talk about in the book is the one really terrifying time I had subbing was this show called um, Kiss, of the, Kiss of the Spider Woman. Um, and like I said, you learn it at home and I would get to a certain point because I would know like, okay, I have to play it in three weeks for the first time. So I'd be practicing it and I'd finally get to a date where I was like, okay, I know it, I can go on. So it was maybe a week and a half before I had to really play it for real. And the pianist said to me, ooh, good news. One of our leading men, um, I guess Brent Carver, right? He was the original lead. He was leaving the show and they said, we have to, um, do a put-in rehearsal for the new person. Put-in means like it's a full run-through. And they said, this will be your chance. You'll actually get a rehearsal with the orchestra. So before you have to play it on Broadway for a paying audience, you'll get to play with the orchestra. Why don't you come in and play? And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. So it was a really hard show, just FYI. It was a, it was a keyboard like this, but um, there's something called a patch change pedal, meaning that you change the sound. So you're like, you know, on an organ, but then you're, then you're like, you know, on a string. Like you keep changing the sounds. Then you have a regular pedal the sustain, and then you have something called a volume pedal, which makes it louder and softer. So it's this really hard thing to do, but I was learning it, but I really wasn't fully ready, but I didn't acknowledge I wasn't fully ready. So I got into the pit, and I was like, okay, whatever, it'll be casual, without realizing like it was a full run through with Cheetah Rivera, who just won the Tony Award, full cast, Hal Prince in the audience, and I was like, this is actually almost more pressure than doing the Broadway show, and I was like, I don't really think I know this well enough. And it began with this crazy piano solo that's like, <laughs> I mean, I was like, what? I was freaking, and it's also really scary music. So I was like so tense. Anyway, as I was playing, the conductor, Ted Sperling, who's brilliant, kept looking at me with these big bug eyes. And I was already so nervous in the first place, and I, word got back to me, they said, there's this really weird vibrato coming out of your synthesizer. So not only was I nervous, but like my synthesizer was like, I, I was, it was like, a vibrato was like, ah, like it was shaking like that. And I was like, Ethel Merman is dead, and in my keyboard, it's like, let me out. <laughs> So they like send in the stage crew and they're trying to fix it as I'm having a panic attack because I really was not prepared. And finally, I realized that I was so nervous that my leg was shaking on the volume pedal. <laughs> so it was like, ah! so I just lifted it off and they were like, it stopped. And I was like, mm -hmm. so anyway, <laughs> it's, it's scary to sub, but once you're ready, it's, it's easy. But I, I was not ready is the end of the story. 
Uh, thank you. And but fan of the opera I did for 15 years. Yes, dear. So you did get the gig. I did get, well, but frankly, I had to fight for it because they were like, I remember him saying, like, I'm very nervous about you playing for the first time. And I said, I'm telling you, I'll be ready. I wasn't ready to say, no, I did get it. And I, I played the shit out of that score. I really <laughs> did. I played it great. But I told him, I said, I just was not ready today, but I did get the gig. And I played it for a long time with, I always make this joke, but I would say, I played it with Cheetah Rivera and <laughs> with Vanessa Williams and with Maria Conchita Alonso. I won't say why we closed, so I'm, I'll say it in Spanish. Maria Conchita Alonso. <laughs> anyway, it's all good, but it didn't last after that. Go. So tell me the other phantom story. Oh, I have so many phantom stories. Um, I love talking about, quote, unquote, um, mishaps. So um, one of my favorite mishaps for me, I have two. I have a phantom mishap, but I have my own mishap, which is, I guess, my classic story. But anyway, the point is, it's just fun to play shows because things always go wrong. And there's certain things called open pits, meaning that the – there's no roof on the pit. It's just, it's totally open. So I'm playing Phantom for like, you know, the 800th time. And there's a moment where Christine, you know, rips the mask off the Phantom and he goes, damn you, you evil woman, how dare you? So when she rips it off, it bounced off the stage into the pit next to my keyboard. So I was like, so, you know, I put it on. So I put <laughs> on the mask, because it's the mask. So like I have the mask on, then I'm like, you know, bah, 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 bah. I'm like, oh my God, I am the Phantom because like, I'm playing the stupid theme song. And I'm trying to get a laugh out of the viola section, which are always uptight. So they're just like, whatever, we have an ugly instrument. I'm like, I know, but look, I'm the Phantom. So anyway, I kept trying to get a laugh. And um, the end of the story is the conductor um, was like looking around the pit with like a panicked look in his face. And I realized that he um, was looking for the mask. And when he finally like looked over at me, I was like, I'm the Phantom. <laughs> so anyway, what I didn't know why he was so panicked is that each mask is actually I thought it was those masks you get at like the iHeart Broadway store, you know, like $2.99. <laughs> but it turns out they're made of the specialty material that specifically molds to the Phantom space. So when I put it on, it was just like, just stretch off. And they were like thrown out, almost fired. Anyway, the end of the story is it's all good. Yes. Yes. How about the mishap in Can Can with Gwen? Oh, it's not quite a mishap. But, you know, I, I sort of love knowing like origin stories about like why are people famous and – the story that I've heard about Gwen Verdon, and you know, I wasn't there, it was before my time, but that she was, um, she did this, I think it was the Aposh dance in Can Can, and it was one of those a la the Rite of Spring, you know, where there was like a riot, but it was the opposite. She kept getting applause, and she went out, she took a bow, and then she left, and she got ready for her next scene, and the applause was so crazy and relentless. They were like, you have to go back out, but she was getting ready for her next scene, but the audience wouldn't stop, so she literally went out for this extra bow, getting ready for the next scene fully in a towel. Isn't that great? And because she, was, she didn't know she was going to get it. And then the amazing Gwen story that, that um, I talk about in the book, which I just love, is um, one of our good pals is Cheetah Rivera. And I grew up obsessed with Cheetah. And it's just crazy that like James and I are friends with her now. And I'm going to do her book event, as a matter of oh. fact, the Boca Raton. She, when she, she was just an ensemble dancer. And that was really her only goal, was to be a, an ensemble dancer. And she was in Can Can, the original Can Can by Copa. I always say to her, I said, it's like saying, like, when I was playing Beethoven's Ninth and Beethoven was conducting me, I mean, she was living in Can Can by Cole Porter, like the original run. So anyway, she was in Can Can by Cole Porter, and they were auditioning for understudies, like we were talking about before. And she auditioned to be Gwen Verdon's understudy because she was in the chorus. And she said after she auditioned, Gwen Verdon, she got a message saying, Miss Verdon wants to see you in her dressing room. And she just said in those days, like, you did not visit the stars. There was total separation between the stars and the ensemble or the chorus. And she went to Gwen Verdon's dressing room and Gwen said, listen, I saw you audition and I don't think you should be anybody's understudy. I think you could be your own star. And she just said it's the first time she really had any confidence that she could actually be a star. And 25 years later, they were literally starring opposite each other in Chicago. Aww. So it's such a beautiful story. That's Isn't that great, great that she gave her the courage and then there they were in Chicago. So another mishap, I think, was yes, with uh, Louise Petri. Oh, this is one of Debbie's favorite stories. So um, in Canada, you know, in Canada, everything has to be in English and in French. And when they were doing Les Mis, Richard J., they had a full French version of the show. So they would do four shows a week in French and four shows a week in English. And during the, um, during the English run, it's like a three-hour show during the English run, Louise Peach Club was singing I Dreamed a Dream and like, you know, the audience was sort of like, what's happening, crossing their eyes, and she's like, what is wrong with this rude audience? And it turns out it was the English show and she sang the entire thing in French. And they're like, what the hell? So after that, Louise said that they would have in the orchestra pit just these giant signs that said, English! So if you looked in the bed, <laughs> or French! So you like knew what the hell you were singing. Because you get mixed up with that shiz. It's, it's amazing. So 
Tell us about what directors do. And can you do it with the story through about Greece and Adrian Barbeau? Yeah, you know, this how a, Adrian Barbeau, really, this is like my, I have two cause célèbres. One is the orchestra size on Broadway and the devastation that now a typical Broadway orchestra was 26 pieces and now it's a solid nine person garage band. It makes my fucking head come off. So that's one of the things I talk about all the time on the radio. It enrages me. The second thing is the fact that Broadway directors are nominated for Tony Awards that direct revivals in the same category as people that direct original shows. It is completely not comparable. When you're directing an original show, you're creating that show with the creators. You're part of the creative process. To take a show that's been a giant hit on Broadway for 10 years and then bring it back and be like, in my version, the word pink outfit, okay? That's not called like amazing Tony Award winning directing. You've taken a, a show that's already perfect and put your own spin on it. It's so rude to put them in the same category. So like, for instance, since the one I was talking about, we, uh, besides, well, uh, the guy was champion, first of all. Hello, Dolly. Hello, Dolly went on the road. It got terrible reviews. And Gary Champion said, we have nine weeks till we come back to Broadway. Every week, I'm going to make one giant change. And that's what he did. So when the show was out of town, he as a director made the changes. For instance, the end of Act One of Hello, Dolly was an entire song about Horace Vandegelder. That was like the end of Act One. It's like, it was his story. And then finally, it was like, why the hell is it his story? And that's when they added Before, before the, parade the Parade Passes, passes by, by, which became the hit. But you don't, so now when Hello, Dolly's revived, it's like the end of Act One is Before the Parade Passes By. That's brilliant direction. It was already there. It's not a skill set. So wait, what was the other story I said I was going to rage about? How do you really feel about it? It enraged, oh, Greece. Now, this to me is, this to me is really interesting. And this is, this is directing, but it's also, by the way, what previews are, which is part of the book too. I, I think a lot of people don't know what a preview is. So, could you explain it? To yeah, because a Thank show. You. Let's say a show. A show is ready. Sh you have rehearsals and everything. You do the tech rehearsals. You can't immediately open because what's amazing in a rehearsal room, as I'm sure Lucy can tell us, but they're playing our song. I'm sure you made changes. What works in a rehearsal room doesn't always work in front of an audience. So you have to have a few weeks to have an audience react which used to be on the road, and now often it's directly on Broadway. But the point is you're running a show in front of an audience, the audience is paying, but it's considered a preview because you're making changes through that time period, and then you freeze the show, a la Ethel Merman's favorite, famous line from Gypsy where they kept changing it before they froze it, and finally she said, call me Miss Birdseye, this show is frozen. But the point <laughs> is you freeze the show when you know that it's done, and then the critics come. So during previews you make the changes. So the story that I heard, which I just think is so fascinating, and again what a director does is, Greece was running um, when it was first running in New York, and there was a song that was not working, and the song was, There Are Worse Things I Can Do, which of course now we know is a great song, a kind of the classic song with heart from the show. But when the show was first in previews, the audience was just not reacting and hating it. And the director and everyone was like, the audience hates the song, I guess we have to cut it, even though they loved it, but they were like, the audience is not liking it. And thank God, and by the way, another reason why, I always say you have a small circle of artistic friends that you talk to while you're creating a show. One of their friends saw it and said, you know, there are worse things I can do happens right after Rizzo thinks she's pregnant. She's very scared she's pregnant, and then she sings the song to Sandy saying like, you know, don't pity me, like, F off. And basically the friend saw the show and said, you know, when Rizzo says she's pregnant, none of her friends care. They kind of just all blow it off. And if they don't really seem to care, we don't care, and therefore the song's not working. And that night, they changed the scene before the song and made all the friends say, oh, Rizzo, do you need any money? Do you need any help? And she rejected them all, but we saw how they cared about her, and then suddenly the song worked. So the song was not changed at all. It was the scene before, but that's what a director does. It says, he took the advice of the friend, and he said, I think this scene needs to be rewritten. So now when Greece is revived, that scene is there, and the worst things I can do works. Brilliant direction. Who cares? The original director is one that did it. So I, there has to be, a, just like there's a separate category for best revival of a musical, best musical, there has to be, literally, first, first of all, there has to be best actress in a revival, best actress in an original show, best director of a revival, best director. It is a different skill set. Next question. And <laughs> Makes me crazy. And I know what else makes you crazy. There's you? no best song, Tony. Well, isn't that weird that movies, which aren't even really about musicals, have a best song Oscar? And yet musical, which are about music, there's no best song? I mean, it's like, why don't they add that category to the Tony Awards? It's, why do movies have it and not the Tonys? David Zippel, can you do something? Get back to me. Um, <laughs> I don't get it, man. Okay. Actors do a run for a very long time in a show. They get a little bored. Yeah. So they play a couple pranks. Oh, What constantly. about Audra? 
Well, I wouldn't say Audra plays the pranks. The pranks, one of the stories I know is that um, one of the shows I played here, we could do the old, the old guessing game. What show was this? Ragtime. Oh, my God, the best piano part. So during Ragtime, the end of Act 1, um, Audra dies. Spoiler alert, but you've had 25 years to see the show. So Audra <laughs> dies at the end of Act 1, and um, after, she, <laughs> after she croaks, she runs off stage, and they put her in a coffin and immediately wheel her back on. It's actually her, and she has to lay there dead while they sing this really devastating song till, till we reach that day. So Audra told me that um, she would run backstage and not realize that the swings, remember what swings are? They didn't have anything to do. They'd be backstage, they would line her coffin with beepers, because it was the late 90s, so everyone had a beeper. They would line the coffin with a beeper. She would lay on top of it, be wheeled back, and then the swings would go to the payphones and call the beepers throughout the whole number. So it was like, zzz, zzz, zzz. <laughs> and she had a beeper on my face. Her hand. <laughs> so that's the inappropriateness. Oh, you know what? Andrea McArdle just told me this story, which I don't even know this. Andrea was 11, no, 13, doing Annie. And um, my husband and I, we just did a Stars in the House, we'll talk about, but Henry Winkler was on the show. So Andrea said, Henry, they had a spy in the audience during Annie. It was Molly's mother. Um, side story, Molly's the youngest orphan. When Andrea went to go do um, Annie in London, the youngest orphan was played by Catherine Zeta-Jones. Just a side oh. note. Have fun. Santa Claus, we never see. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> even then she was smoking. But the point is, um, Henry Winkler was in the audience, and Andrea got the orphans together because the spy told them, and Andrea said that there's the end of you never fully dressed without a smile. They go, smile, da 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 smile. Anyway, Andrea said that the, the orphans had to change the choreography. And when I say had to, Andrea said she told the orphans, I will never speak to you again if you don't do this. And all the orphans had to do, never really dress without a smile. Da, da. They literally had to do the A, thumbs up to Henry Winkler. And it was one of the many times Andrea was written up like the M&M's event. So people get bored and they put, you know, the whole thing is like you try to pull pranks without getting in trouble. Oh my God, my favorite prank. You try to pull pranks without getting in trouble. This one is like, this one is... <laughs> Anyway, okay, so you guys know Brian Darcy James. Sure. He, okay, he's about to come back to Broadway in Days of Wine and Roses. So he's in the ensemble of Carousel. And it was his final performance. And a lot of shows have like dancers who sing and singers who dance, you know, and you kind of modify. So he was a singer who, you know, moved. So he was always in the back of this one number. And the dancers would do, it's called a, a double tour. So you jump in the air, turn around twice, twice and then land. So he only had to do the single. So it was the last performance, and he's backstage with Tay Diggs, who now is super famous, but back then was just in the chorus with Brian. And Brian said, that number's so fun. He goes, I think I'm gonna try to do a double tour at the end, because I've never done it. And he said for some reason, Tay was really serious, and was like, Brian, don't. <laughs> and he was like, whatever, who cares? I'm gonna try it for fun. So they get to that point in the song, Brian goes to do the double tour, and at that moment, he didn't know, but all the other men had made a plan to do it. So when Brian went to the double tour, all the other men, instead of doing the double tour with him, literally just went like this. Uh. So Brian was like, <laughs> He was furious and devastated, go. Could you do that? No, never mind. No, ma'am. So, Book of Mormon, Tony nomination. Oh, well, this story is about a bigger story, and Xavier, you can appreciate this, I hope. It's like. Basically, don't take, try to take jobs because you want to take them because you don't know where they're going to lead. Don't take a job you don't want to take, but take a job because you want to take it because if you do a good job and you're into it, good things can happen. I'll tell just a pre-story to that, which is Sutton Foster, I, I met Sutton, we were doing Grease together on Broadway, and I thought she was amazing. She was like 19. And she went on to play Eponine in the national tour of Les Mis. So she tried out for Thoroughly Modern Millie, and didn't get it. She wants to play the lead, she didn't get it. She got the ensemble. So her agent called and said, you didn't get the Earl of Modern Millie, they want you in the chorus, but amazing news, they want you to play Eponine on Broadway. And Sutton said to me, it was more money than she'd ever been offered to play a role. But she really wanted to be part of a new show. And so she said, I want to do Thoroughly Modern Millie. And the agent was like, cut. She's like, you literally have a lead in Les Mis on Broadway or ensemble in a new show at a regional theater in California. And she was like, I want to be part of something new. I don't need to do Les Mis. I've already done it. I don't care about the money. And she took the ensemble in Thoroughly Modern Millie. And as probably a lot of you know, she was the understudy for the lead. And they wound up, sadly, but it worked out for her, firing the leading lady. Sutton was the understudy, took over the role, and won the Tony Award. That's but amazing. she didn't take it because she wanted to win the Tony Award. She took it because it was artistically satisfying. So it's just a great message. She, just, she liked playing Eponine, but she'd done it already. And she's like, I want to be part of something new. 
So the story that we're talking about is uh, my friend Rory O'Malley was offered the ensemble in the Book of Mormon, just the chorus. But every time they, something called, which they talk about in the book too, when, when musicals first begin, they usually do something called a reading. So you first sit around a table, you read it, then you do a stage reading where you're still holding scripts, but there's more staging to it. Then you do a workshop where it's more court. You keep building up. So he kept being called back to be in the ensemble of the Book of Mormon, but he was so good, they kept giving him lines. So he got more and more lines in the ensemble, and then he finally got a song. And then finally, he had like a role, even though he was just in the ensemble at first, and it was Tony Award Day, and he got a Tony nomination. And he said he called his mom, who worked as a secretary in the Midwest and was really nervous and just didn't know about show business, and he called her, and Debbie wants to be the mom. This is a verbatim conversation. She had two comments. At first he called her and he goes, Mom, Mom, I got nominated for a Tony Award. And she said, You did? Really? He said, Yes, Matthew Broderick announced it. And she said, Are you sure? And he said, yes, they said it on TV. And she finally said, you better have someone double check that. Only <laughs> double check. Oh, we meant Rory O'Schmally. So anyway, <laughs> but that's what's nice. He took it just to be an ensemble, but he did such a great job. It turned into a Tony-nominated role. So sideshow. Oh. I cracked up when I read about My, this. I'm glad that it translated into writing, because that's it is a hard skill set to, like, I have to say, write a comedy story like write it down and make it be funny. So I'm glad that you laughed at it. I do. I, I love mishap stories. So this is I, one of my favorite mishaps. So if you don't know, Sideshow is about, by the way, the whole book is not just comedy. It's also educational. But the point is, um, this comedy, they let me really speak in my own voice. They didn't make me be like, you know, music, you know, they let me like be funny in it, thank God. Basically, I have all these side things that are called Seth Speaks. So first I'll tell something serious that I'm like, Sassafras. Um, but anyway, the Sideshow story is, um, it's about conjoined twins. So based really in real life on Daisy and Violet Hilton who were conjoined and Emily Skinner and Alice Ripley started in it. And they weren't um, in costumes that were connected. They just stood next to each other and it looked like they were conjoined. So they did this one number where they would sing the song, why can't you leave me alone? And they would back up and the sarcophagus, no, this, the curtains would close in front of them. They would be backstage for around 35 seconds, completely change their outfits into this like Egyptian, look and then it would be a sarcophagus they would get into and that would open up and they would begin this vaudeville number. So they would back up really angrily, curtain would go, these men would do this 30 second dance of like, here they are, Egypt's greatest queens, and it would go into this vaudeville number. So Emily, Tommy, and Alice, they backed up as the men were doing this number, introducing them, they're doing their quick change. Alice is completely changed and ready to go in and Emily is like standing there pulling on her costume and she's like, why won't this fit? She'd missed the matinee, but she's like, I couldn't have gained 25 pounds in one day. And she realized that her understudy had gone on and her dresser had laid out her understudy's costume, who was a size zero. So literally there was no way she could get it on. So the dresser had to go to their dressing room, which was like on the fourth floor. So Emily is standing there, the dresser runs away, and Alice is helping by laughing hysterically. So not literally just laughing. And the poor men, they finished like the number, and the conductor's like, here, literally, here we are. So they have to keep doing this stupid circle where they're like, Egypt's greatest queens, but ba 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 here they are. So they keep doing this crazy circle. Emily is like waiting and waiting. They, she finally gets the costume on. They get, into, they get into the sarcophagus, which is really small, and right before it opens, they realize that they'd gotten in on the wrong side, <laughs> and they had reversed. So it's like they'd had the surgery to separate, and they got reconnected <laughs> on the other side. So they have to leave the sarcophagus, get back in, and they set it open, and the men were just like, <sighs> <sighs> devastated. But it all worked out, although the show did close. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> so costumes are really important, and they're iconic. And oh, we yeah, talk about that. By the way, just one thing. All I know about our funny stories about actors, I had to research all the other stuff and it killed me. But I do write about like stage managers and set design and costumes, but holy cow, it killed me. Yes, I wrote about costumes. Yes, so we love audience participation. We're going to show you a few slides. Show them how smart we are. Tell them what <laughs> show the costumes Well, because I was saying, you could look at a costume and identify the show. That's how iconic. <laughs> Andrew McCardle. Next. And that's Sandy. Correct, Book of Mormon. Fiddler. Zero. God, they're good. Beetlejuice. Oh, that's a great costume, yeah. Oh, my God. That's Cheetah, by the way, West Side Story. And that's Leanne Plain. Yeah, the costume is, my God. Evan Hansen. I don't even need the person in it. Bravo. 
Oh my God, I love that show so much. South Pacific. Oh my God, that's on Broadway right now. Back to the Future, that's the brilliant Roger Bart, in case he likes. Oh my God, he's hilarious in that show. Into the Woods, Little Red Riding Hood. My fair lady, love. And we're a really smart audience. Bravo, very you. impressed. Should I do my, I told Debbie, I said, I do this on my Broadway cruises. I said, just call out the name of somebody famous and I'll tell you a funny story about them. Anyone have somebody you want to hear a story about? Patty Lapone, sure. Um, Patty Lapone was doing a movie called 1941 with Steven Spielberg and um, she had a final callback for Vita and she said, can I fly to New York and do my final callback for Vita? And they said, we let an actor take off a day once and then it turns out we needed him and it screwed up the filming schedule. We can't let you leave. And she was like, I have to, it's a final callback. And they said, okay, we'll let you leave, but if you don't make it back in time for your filming, your career in Hollywood is over. And she was like, I have a career in Hollywood? She said she was so excited. She's like, I didn't even know I had one. So she flies to New York, and it's the day, if you remember this, it was the day of the giant snowstorm in 1978. And I remember it because I got to miss school that day. It was the most amazing day of my life. Oh, my God. I didn't know there were snow days until that year. It was amazing. So anyway, she said it was completely snowing. She trudged to the theater, soaking wet pants. She, th she gets to the theater, she walks there for her final callback, she said there was a line on the stage, and she was like, oh, they want me to stand behind the line? F that. And she's like, I refuse to stand behind the line. And she stood in front of it. Little did she realize that the theater was in the, a chorus line theater, and that was the set. It was just the line from a chorus line, which, by the way, her brother was starring in, and she didn't realize it. She's like, how dare they tell me where to stand? It's like, they weren't telling you where to stand. Anyway, so she defiantly stepped over the line, she does her final callback, goes to the airport, and is like, you know, she has to make it back or else her career in Hollywood is over. And um, all the flights, because of the snowstorm, they all got booked. She didn't know she had to rebook. She thought they would just put her on the next flight. She has no flight back, and she's like, oh my God, I promised I might be back, what am I gonna do? And she runs into her old Juilliard classmate, Christopher Reeve. And she's oh. like, I'm freaking out because I can't get back for the Steven Spielberg movie. And he comes back a minute later and he goes, oh, turns out they had an extra first class ticket. Of course, now she realizes that he bought it for her, but she didn't even know it then. So she got on the flight and she said, when everyone was like, how did you make it back so fast? She said, Superman. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. So there's the story. Anyone got another <clears throat> one? Just shout. Who? Bernstein. Oh, Leonard Bernstein. God, I'm obsessed with him. Um, Cheetah Rivera told me that, um, you know, he would often uh, conduct the show. And um, he was like conducting uh, the quintet, which I'm so obsessed with. And suddenly he was gone, and she's like, he left the pit? Turns out he would stand on a platform and was so crazily aggressive with his stamping, he literally <laughs> fell to the platform and was completely gone. Oh, wait, I have one more West Side Story story. Martin Charnin told me, um, Martin Charnin, who wrote Annie, was an original dancer in West Side Story. He was a jet. And they went to Chicago. And you know the beginning of the show goes like, um, all the snaps. So the dance captain, who's in charge of the dancing, you'll see that, got the jets together and she was like, someone snapping is off. And he's like, it is. She's like, yeah, because he sounds like snap, 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 snap. And they're like, we've been doing the same snaps on Broadway because they were doing the tour. And she's like, the snapping is off, I tell you. Finally, they realized, and if any of you are pit musicians, you may know this, when you're playing in an orchestra, sometimes it'll have like the lyrics in a couple of sections that are really obvious or it'll say like phone rings to kind of like make you know what's going on on stage so you can kind of hear it. So the drummer saw and it's in parentheses, snap, snap. And he's like, I guess I snap. So they were going snap, snap, snap. So because of the sound, so the poor dancers were being blamed because of the dumbass drummer in the pit. Yes. What else, dear? So we can't end without talking about Stars in the House mm. and COVID and your husband, James, and what you guys did for Broadway Cares and the Actors Fund. Actors Fund. Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. <clears throat> I met someone very sweet before the show talking about it. So basically, if you don't know, Broadway shut down. I have a hair in my mouth? What's happening? Um, Broadway shut down on Thursday. I think it was March 6th, 13th, March 12th. So James and I realized that um, no one was going to be working. If you don't know, the Actors Fund was not called the Entertainment Community Fund. They changed the name to make it more clear what they do. It is for anyone in entertainment at all. Actor, singer, dancer, backstage, musician, stagehand, casting director, kid, anybody in the arts can get help from the Entertainment Community Fund. So we knew they were gonna be getting all these calls for money because nobody was gonna work. We, did, we thought it was gonna be a month. We didn't know it was gonna be for how long. So James and I said, we should do something online, some kind of a fundraiser. So I said, oh, let's get some of our friends together. We'll interview them online, ask for donations. And I thought I was really smart because I didn't know anything about in those days about Zoom. So I was like, okay, we'll do Facebook Live and I'll call up Kelly O'Hara on FaceTime and I'll have her over here 
and I'll be able to interview her because it, it's such amazing technology. I could hold up my iPhone and people will see her. I'm a genius. So he was like, and cut. So James and our friend, um, James researched with our friend David Katz. They founded this thing called StreamYard, which is like Zoom. And we realized we could do a split screen and we interviewed Kelly O'Hara and she sang songs because I sent her pre-recorded piano music. And we started on that. So Broadway shut down Thursday. We started that Monday with a 2 p.m. show, 8 p.m. show. And after that, we did 2 p.m., 8 p.m., 2 p.m., basically every day for months. 2 p.m. and 8 p.m., 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. And every day, then we cut down finally to 8 p.m. But we would ask for money to raise for the Actors Fund, and we're still going with it because, sadly, they're still needing money. And at this point, James, how much have we raised? $1.2 million. Just James, for my friends. can you stand up? James, stand up. This is my husband. Thank you, honey. So... so Yes, dear. I hate to say this because I could sit and listen to these stories. Yes, ma'am. Sure, but you got to really talk loud so our microphones talk can loud, pick it up. Talk loud, we're live streaming, dear. <laughs> you don't. This backstage, you mean? Backstage. Cool, full stalking, yes. <laughs> In the Bronx. Yes. Where's the comedy part? Go on. People put makeup on before shows, yes? Yes, Sammy Davis Jr. Well, so yeah. you know what you get to do today? You get to get in line, have Seth sign your book, and he'll tell you even more stories. We're having a line after the show? Who even yes, knew that? Yes, wait, we're going to do that. But oh. before we do that, hang on. You have one last story to tell. Oh, this is my final story? The, uh, oh, man. Seth, okay, I'm fine. sorry. By the way, my, my father's wife went to high school with Steve Lawrence, and she still has a giant crush on him, Gloria. So, yeah, Gloria, one day, good luck. Um, I got to work with Steve Lawrence on the Carol Burnett 50th anniversary special, and he was so funny. I was showing him music, and I said, oh, I said, you have a tiny part. And he said, who told you? <laughs> he was really funny. <laughs> he was funny. All right, so this is my final story. And then when I'm signing books after this? So, so after your final story... People will line up. You'll get to sign their books right over there, and okay. they can tell you all the stories. All right, I'll hear. We'll have so such this is my final time. story. I just think this. I said I said I have one final funny story, which I always leave them laughing. So I was playing the show Victor Victoria on Broadway, and I was playing dance rehearsals, and I became obsessed with this dance from the show, which I'll show you a little bit of. It was Rachel York. She would go, um, she'd go, when, bum, they say, uh, uh, hey, uh, uh, I'm from Shy, uh, 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 obsessed with it, because I just love the aggression and the line. So um, I was just the, the sub, and I was subbing for my friend Joe Thalkin. So Joe was the conductor, and whenever I would run into Joe, just stupidly, I'd be like, oh, Joe, when, bah, they say, began, gunk, gunk. So um, we both went to the same gym. So as usual, one day I see him on the Stairmaster, and I run right in front of him as usual, and I'm like, Joe, when, ah, uh, they say, ah, uh, and it wasn't him. Oh! Still devastated. Peace out. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Seth Rudevsky. Thank you, Deb Miller. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. That was Thank really you. fun.